Hi, I'm Steve Patton. I'm a community liaison for Catholic Funeral and Cemetery Services. Now, you can imagine that goes across a little differently than if I were to have said, this is Steve Patton. I'm a community liaison for Disneyland. Okay, because those words, cemetery and funeral, uh, are not the most pleasant terms, and they conjure up, uh, you know, not so positive emotions. In fact, uh, negative emotions, certainly not emotions that would be like the ones we would get when we think about Disneyland. But the fact is that death, funerals, cemeteries are every bit as much of our human experience as baptisms and weddings. Our church is present for us at the happy moments of our lives like baptisms and weddings, and our church is also present for and with us in the sad moments of our lives, too, when people pass away, funerals, and, uh, and then laying our loved ones to rest. I am going to, before I proceed any further, I'm going to provide my cell number for the sake of those who are attending remotely. Uh, those who are attending her live had the advantage of picking up uh, certain resources. Uh, I welcome you, for those of you who did not pick up those resources, there's a table just outside the door where all of this is. I'm going to quickly go through what is available out there. And for those of you who are online, if you wish me to mail that, any of these items to you, please just text me and text me your mailing address and I'll put them in the mail to you. I'll review quickly what they are. Uh, oops. There is a prayer card uh, for a prayer for a peaceful and happy death. There's a prayer card, prayer against coronavirus. There's a prayer, an election prayer. I wish I had a prayer to stop the fires, but I don't have that. Uh, but one crisis is, you know, we just don't need another crisis, right? My business card a little pamphlet called Five Reasons to Pre-Plan Your End-of-Life Services. And then there's a couple of things I printed out, the recommended resources, and I'll be, I will be referring to this. There's a lot that I got packed into this hour. In fact, there's a lot more that I wish I could uh, pack in, but I'll be referring to resources where you can get more information if you would like. So there's recommended resources, and then there's also really, really recommended resources that I've got that are in bold face. And then there's this other handout called Simon, A Glimpse of Heaven, uh, which is a very profound near-death experience story that I'll be uh, reading from later. I've got two goals for this hour that we'll spend together. One, you got a preview of it in the flyer, the pr uh, promotional flyer, and that is that I really want you, just like I want me, to look forward to the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. We profess this every Sunday, in the, it's the punchline of the Nicene Creed, but like so many of our prayers, do we really deeply own that concept of looking forward to the life that awaits us on the other side? We're going to be dead a whole lot longer than we ever were alive, no matter how long a life that you live. So ultimately, we're going to plan for the destination, the dwelling where we will be forever and ever and ever. I want you to look forward to it, and I want you to prepare for it. My talk will be divided similarly into two parts. First will be a review of what our essential Catholic beliefs are about what's known as the last things, typically death, judgment, heaven, hell. I'll also throw in purgatory, and I'm going to also throw in uh, some accounts from near-death experiences which in very interesting ways correspond with what we believe by faith. So I'll review that basic Catholic teaching, and then I will uh, also offer you some travel tips as we get ready for our departure into that promised land. So I'll start with death, talking about death. And when I talk about death, I'm going to ask you to understand it in terms of three fundamental facts. I'll call them the hard fact, the good fact, and the great fact. First of all, the hard fact, you will die one day. We are living organisms, 
And like all living organisms, from fruit flies to sequoia trees, we have a lifespan, we come to the end of that lifespan, either earlier or later, and we die. We don't know exactly when it will happen, we only know that it will happen. This is one of those things, though, that we can know, but not really believe. So I urge all of us to really take ownership in the fact that there will come that final day that'll be our last day. And we can and should plan for it and prepare for it in the same way that we would prepare for any other major event in our lives, like the, our wedding or the birth of a child or a graduation or a final exam. We should be prepared for it. So that's the hard fact. There will come that day when we will pass. The good fact, you will survive your death. The you that is you that is you, the essential person that animates your body will survive your death. And as I'll get into in a moment, this is a fact that is not just one that we believe because of our faith. There's substantial scientific evidence to support that, and I will be reviewing that. So we are no fools to believe by faith what we can also have conf confirmed by scientific evidence. So that's the good, good fact. You're going to survive it. It's going to be hard. No one looks forward to it, to debt the dying part, but you're going to survive it. The third great fact is that God wants you in heaven. In fact, God wants you in heaven more than you want you to be in heaven. He is on our side. He's providing us all the guidance and all the strength and all the support and graces that we need to get there. So bottom line, God does not want us to be scared of death, but he does want us to be prepared for it. Now we're going to look at the whole journey of life leading up to death as the journey on a river. This is a series of four paintings that were created by Thomas Cole back in 1842 that depict the journey of any human life in terms of the voyage along a river. This is the first of those images, the voyage of life, childhood, new voyager emerging from the womb, life filled with joy, wonder, innocence, and trust. The next image is the one that is the image on the, uh, on the uh, uh, flyer that I put together and sent out for you. Lots of hopefulness. Uh, aspiration, seeing heaven in the distance, being all excited about it, in control of his life. And then reality sets in, the voyage of life, manhood. I love the image of this guy just crawl, calling out to God for help. It always reminds me of a joke I heard once. To, do you know the difference between people who pray in a church and people who pray in a casino? The people in a casino are really serious about it. Finally, the river ends and spills out into the ocean like all rivers do. The river representing the voyage of time, the ocean representing the vast expanse of eternity. The landscape is barren. The time of earthly voyage ends and we enter into the next life. I want to summarize here now the voyage of this life, and these are the images for each of the four stages that were depicted in the, in the paintings. The voyage of this life is all about preparing for death and the life of the world to come. This is true for Jesus too. The journey of his life had to pass through death. He accepted that into his humanity just like he accepted everything else. At the moment of our bodily death, our souls will journey into a new experience of reality. But it's not going to be entirely new. As we are each body-soul unities, as human persons, and as body and souls join together, each our body dwells in a certain realm and our souls dwell in a certain realm as well. Our bodies dwell in the material, physical, three-dimensional world, which we'll call the natural world, while our soul inhabits a non-material, spiritual realm, 
more of a non-dimensional, supernatural world. Most of the time, we're not aware of that other world, that supernatural world, because we're just so absorbed by the sensory world around us. But nevertheless, we do inhabit, even now, that supernatural world. Let me put, give you this analogy. You know that the stars shine all the time, right? It's just during the nighttime that we're able to see the stars because the sun is no longer illuminating the atmosphere so as to wash out the, the, the light from the stars. But when evening comes, the sun goes down and we're able to behold what was there all along. It's likewise with our lives. You know, we are even now inhabiting that supernatural world. When we physically die, the senses die, but our souls then become aware of the world, that supernatural world that was there all along. So we are simultaneously citizens of planet Earth, which we see around us, and citizens of the universe. Likewise, we are citizens of this world, and we are citizens of the, the, the kingdom of heaven even now. And now we'll get into why we can believe that, not simply as a matter of faith, but also that there is scientific evidence to support this from near-death experiences. Before I journey any further into this, though, I want to set up guardrails, two guardrails, because we're talking, when we talk about near-death experiences, we're talking about a, what's known as a paranormal phenomenon, something that is beyond the normal, ordinary experience of life as we know it. And those two guardrails are, don't believe everything you hear, but don't not believe anything that you hear, okay? And there are two extremes. There are people who believe every apparition, every story, every account of, you know, anybody that said anything about, you know, the supernatural world. Whereas the other, the other half is those who deny all of it. This is known as scientific materialism or atheistic materialism. Those are people who believe that there is no such thing as God, angels, devils, souls, supernatural world. It's this, is, this 3D world is what you see is what you get. There's nothing else. And that the you that you think is you, nah, it's just a product of your brain, right? So those two extremes, we're staying within those. The church is very careful and discerning about miracles, okay? Even if something miraculous happens, for example, in the cause of someone's, uh, uh, you know, becoming a saint, the church examines that very carefully and interprets it very carefully. The same thing as we journey into these near-death experiences. Now, on this resource sheet, which I hope you all pick up as you leave, and again, I mentioned to those who are attending remotely, I'm happy to email this to you. There's a, a number of different recommended resources and uh, several of them, five of them have to do with uh, scientific and medical uh, resources about near-death experiences. So now keep in mind, these are not just anecdotal accounts. There was one that, was, that came out a few years ago that was turned into a movie, a little boy named Todd Burpo who survived a near-death experience. That uh, uh, story was Heaven is for Real, a little boy's astounding story of his trip to heaven and earth, to, or to heaven and back, all right? So there's anecdotal accounts, and then there's scientific literature that is written analyzing these near-death experiences, which uh, you know, many, many people have had. And those studies confirm that there is, in fact, a transphysical part of us. Now, they may not call it the soul. They would call it consciousness or psyche or uh, mind, whatever you want to call it. The, that, so there is a non-material aspect of us. The, in fact, it's the core aspect and that it does survive death, and that there is an afterlife. Some of the common features of near-death experiences, and by common features, I mean uh, not everyone has the same experience, but there, there are elements of these uh, experiences, when you look at thousands and thousands of them, that there are common patterns that emerge from them. The, probably the most common among them are the near-death, or the out-of-body experience, where somebody feels himself or herself actually floating up in the corner of the room looking down on their bodies 
as like, you know, the EMTs are working furiously to try to restore life to this person or the surgical team when the person's uh, apparently died or flatlined on the operating table. They're observing all this with a heightened sense of awareness. They're, you know, they're, 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 their perception is more acute than it's ever been. 360 degree vision and a sense of reality, and many, many will use this term, what I experienced was more real than real. Many will describe having passing through a tunnel, experiencing a life review. You may have heard the term, uh, my whole life flashed before me. That is a common experience where people see their lives, the totality of their lives, as if like in a hologram, for better and for worse, the good choices that they made and the not so good choices that they made. An altered, and it's, so this is like a kind of form of judgment. They feel their lives being held up and illumined and, oh my gosh, if I could do it all over again, I would change this or that. An altered sense of time and space. They will often talk about encountering other beings, mystical beings like Jesus. I will read from you a remarkable account later on from somebody who had such a uh, near-death experience, deceased relatives, friends, an experience which they will describe of unconditional, indescribable love such that they'd never experienced before from a pure, mystical, brilliant light. They will often say that they come back from this experience no longer afraid of death. Now, in the flyer, I pointed out there is this fundamental distinction between fear of dying and fear of death. Okay, fear of dying, everyone, that's natural to have a fear of dying. Jesus had a fear of dying. You know, if a wild dog lunges at you, you're going to recoil. Your body doesn't want to, to suffer injury and you don't want to die. Okay, that's the physical response that we have to the notion of pain and suffering and death. But the concept of death that there is something beyond that, something wonderful beyond that. We don't have to be afraid of death. God wants us to have a renewed hope for what lies beyond death. And many of these people who have had these near-death experiences, people of no faith or very little faith, come back and they attest exactly to that. Many come back with transformed lives from the experience, more forgiving, more tolerant, less critical of other people, more appreciative of their relationships, less money-focused, less materialistic, less aggressive, desire to help others. Again, common patterns among people who've seen what life is really all about. In summary, as I want to move now from talking about death to talking about judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, we need to reframe the meaning of death. Understood within a framework of our Catholic belief and supported by scientific evidence, what is otherwise a meaningless, empty event can take on a much greater meaning, that it is the portal that we pass through to get to the life that God has planned for us from the foundation of the world. It is not only not the end, but it's the beginning of something unimaginably wonderful. Death ends our time for accepting or rejecting God's mercy. The chance to say yes or no to God will be over. The look of God will be our judgment. And this is a religious belief not limited to Christianity. Across all religious traditions, there's a u almost universal understanding that our lives, you know, we're, we're to be held accountable for our lives. Our lives matter. There is a moral dimension to our lives that we will make an account for. Now, the good news, oops, before we get to hell, let's talk about the, the good news is that God, uh, you know, again, wants us to pass through that judgment. He, Jesus is our advocate by our side. He wants us to make it to heaven. The scripture says, quoting St. John of the Cross, at the evening of our lives, we will be judged by our love. How have we loved in this life? That will be what determines our destiny. 
At the moment of our death, our souls will go to one of three places. No coming back. This is death, not a near-death experience. This is the death experience. Hell, purgatory, or heaven. No one knows for sure what percentages go to each, but we, we will each go to one of those three. Hell. If we call Jesus our Savior, that means that he is saving us from something. And what he is saving us from is eternal separation from himself. Scripture speaks repeatedly of the unquenchable fire of damnation, of the possibility of separation from God forever. Jesus did speak of it, not threateningly, but in terms of warning that our lives matter and they will be held to account. And not just for the bad things that we do, but for the good things that we didn't do. Remember the sermon about uh, you know, whatsoever you did for the least of my brethren, you did that to me. And whatever you didn't do for the least of my brethren, you didn't do it for me. So we got to take this care of the poor and the marginalized very seriously. This is something that, does, that is shaping our uh, eternal destiny. God, again, wants that for no one, but he leaves us free to choose it if we will. Love C.S. Lewis. I read so many books by him, and the way he puts it is, I'll read a couple of quotes from his, the doors of hell are locked on the inside. The souls there enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded, and they are therefore self-enslaved. Just as the blessed, forever submitting to obedience, become through all eternity more and more free. So again, in this, the second quote of C.S. Lewis, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. This isn't what I wanted. So there is that possibility of hell. And I'll move quickly to purgatory in a second, but I want to tell you the best ways to avoid hell. Number one, believe that it exists. Believe that it's possible for you or anyone else to go there, at least theoretically. Regularly repent of your sins. Be kind and charitable toward those in need. Pray for final perseverance. You all received that. Again, that was one of the prayers that I handed out to you, the prayer for a peaceful and happy death, to pray that regularly. God, I want to be with you for all eternity. And also, finally, a deeply dedicated prayer that nobody goes there. God, and again, that's not to say any, but that nobody is going to go there, but that we don't have a desire that anyone goes there. God doesn't desire it, and neither should we. Option number two, purgatory. A final purification might be needed for those of us who die in God's grace and friendship but still are in need or to be cleansed of the stains of our sin and our, also our attachments to sin. Now, the experience of those in, in purgatory is entirely different. It is, it is a suffering. Suffer, talking about the suffering souls in purgatory, but their suffering is an entirely different type of suffering from those in, in hell. Those in hell curse God. Those in purgatory rejoice in God's mercy and goodness. And there is, among the souls in purgatory, an absolute assurance of heaven. I like to describe purgatory as heaven's mudroom. Okay. You ever want to know what a mudroom is? That's the room, the first, you know, you've been outside, you're dirty, you're filthy, it's been pouring down rain. You come inside the house, you're in, and you close the door behind you. You're in, okay? You're, 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 you're going to come in, but you're not yet ready to walk on the carpets, okay? There needs to be a time of taking off that filthy clothing before you can enter into the glorious house that is your inheritance. So, purgatory is a cleansing experience. 
And again, on, I'll just refer you to the resource sheet. A couple of great free downloadable resources. One called How to Avoid Purgatory. That's a good read. And then there's another one called An Unpublished Manuscript on Purgatory. You'll see it all about it in the, in the handout. Why is there a purgatory? Basically, because we're all mixed bags, right? I mean, we live as mixed bags, and we probably are going to die as mixed bags. So there needs to be that final letting go of the, all of that which is not of God. Finally, let's move to this destination for which we were all created and which we all desire, which is heaven. An experience of supreme, endless beauty and happiness beyond all understanding and description. As St. Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor is it so much even entered into the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Heaven, in that sense, is literally unimaginable. In other words, we cannot summon up, adequately summon up the images in our mind of what it is all about. It would be like Trying to imagine somebody who's been blind from birth. They've never known the faculty of sight. How would you describe the color blue to that person? How would you describe color period to that person? They're just, they never were wired for it. It's the same with this amazing life that God has waiting for us in heaven. Ineffable. I'll quote one near-death experience survivor who put it this way, and he was, didn't want to describe it, but he kept being impressed and said finally, okay, if you took the 1,000 best things in your life and multiplied them by a million, maybe you could get close to the feeling that I went through. And keep in mind, he didn't go to heaven. He was on the outskirts of heaven, wanting to go in. And I'll read you another absolutely amazing account. In fact, that will be one of the ones you can pick up, the Simon, a glimpse of heaven uh, later on. We will see God face to face in heaven. The one who dwells, as scripture says, in unapproachable light, we will finally, by his grace, enter into his presence. God is the one, as uh, the author of the book of Acts describes it, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Okay, now I want to, that's, that's, a, that's so packed with, with, uh, with meaning there, and I want to help you unpack that for a second here. A little thought experiment. I want you to all to imagine a rabbit. Okay, imagine a rabbit. Now imagine that rabbit jumping around. All right. That imagined jumping rabbit that you created lives and moves and has its being in your mind. It depends upon you to exist in the moment you think about the next thing, that imagined rabbit disappears. It is the same for us and our relationship with God. Each of us is a thought of God. And if he were to cease thinking of us for an instant, we would cease to be. And that analogy is even a little bit faulty in the sense that me and you and the created hopping rabbits that we imagined are, cre are creatures. God is the uncreated source of all that is. And we, each of us here, each of you remotely, this entire universe exists in God's mind. He is projecting it, loving it from one moment to the next into existence. That, so creation flowing out of God's eyes from moment to moment. And meeting God face to face will be the moment when all along what's been the reality that God loving us into existence, we will finally be able to behold the God who is creating us, we will look directly into his eyes, the source of our very being and the source of our identity. Everything that is unique in me has its source in God. Unimaginable bliss. It's the ultimate end and the fulfillment of all of our deepest longings. As St. Augustine put it, O oh God, you have made us for yourself, and therefore 
Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. I'm going to shift now into travel tips on how to get ready for this journey. Prepare for liftoff. This image, the launch of Apollo 11 on July 16th, 1969. Last year we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, or as my brother Mike, in, who's watching this now in Virginia, says, this is the 50th anniversary of the fake moon landing. So I just wanted to mention that in your honor, Mike. Uh, but can you imagine all the years and man hours of preparation that went behind the moment of this launch that sent for the first time in human history, that sent fellow human beings outside of our planet to another celestial object, the moon. The epic journey. And imagine then, they again, like get back to this analogy of the daylight and the stars, right? This rocket punching through the atmosphere of the day, and within minutes, universe opens up before them. And this is analogous to our death. We will be here in the day in one minute, and as we die, we punch through into the supernatural life that's been all around us all along, and God waiting for us on the other side. Jesus often spoke, again, of death and judgment and of being prepared and promising us this rich and beautiful, eternal life beyond it. When we die, we will look back on this life and see that it actually was all a preparation for the next life. I want to ask for a show of hands. Sometimes I do this in a talk. I'll say, who here is prepared to die today? And of course, you know, most people don't want to raise their hands. And most people don't. But then I say, no, no, no. I want everyone to raise your hands because you are prepared to die today. The question is, are you well prepared or are you poorly prepared? Okay, so the goal is to be prepared to die any day, to be called forth to make an account of our lives. When it happens, death will involve a triple separation, and therefore it calls for a triple preparation. And by that I mean every one of us who are now alive, we hold, each of us holds three things together. And you make decisions about each one of those three. And those three things are your body, your soul, and your possessions. So from moment to moment, you decide, you know, you make decisions about the state of your soul. I'm either growing in my relationship with God or I'm not growing in my relationship with God. I'm improving my spiritual life or not. My body, I'm taking care of my body or I'm not taking care of my body. I'm moving my body over here. I'm moving my body over there. You get the point, right? So our, we are in control of what happens to our bodies. And the same thing with our possessions. You know, I earn money, I spend money. I give things away, I am given things. I am in control of material possessions. The moment we die, though, each of those three things that we had been holding together are no longer held together. They all three go in separate directions, and we lose control over all three of them, including our souls. Your time for making your decision about which way you're going to go is, is up. You're, 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 you've made your decision. So now, while we're still alive, is time that we make preparations for what is going to happen to each one of those three. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about how to prepare for the separation from your possessions, because that is the, that's not what we call the main competence of the church. The church is concerned about the human person, which is the body-soul unity. So we'll talk, I'll talk mostly about preparing for our bodies and preparing for our souls. But I will talk briefly here about our possessions, because they do matter. And it's a funny thing, you know, those three things that we hold together, which I'll just ask you, which of those three is the least important? Possessions, right? But which is the one that we spend the most time thinking about? You know? And which is the one that we spend the most time preparing for being separated from it? 
Most people have, or a lot of people will have wills and estate plans and whatnot, but haven't given a second thought to their souls or what's going to happen to their body. So anyway, I'm going to try to reorient those priorities here. All right, first of all, prepare well for what's going to happen to your possessions. Remember the old guy at the, excuse me, the end of the uh, uh, voyage through the river, he finally comes to the ocean. Uh, that's the moment where you leave it all behind. Naked I came into the world, and naked I shall leave. So the possessions are going to be left as we enter out into eternity. Now, we at uh, Catholic Funeral and Cemetery Services have beautiful, fully equipped uh, funeral coaches, also known as hearses. But there's one thing that none of them is equipped with, a trailer hitch. As Billy Graham put it once, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Okay, so it ain't going with you. So start practicing detachment from our possessions now. Hold everything that you own in open, extended hands. You're still in control of it, but don't, you're not gripping it. Open, extended hands, because eventually you're going to be letting it go, and you don't want there to be a struggle. And again, this is something that the near-death experience survivors will frequently talk about as they come back much less attached to anything that they own because they realize just how fundamentally unimportant it is. Second thing I'll say about possessions and learning to get prepared to get, let go of them is be generous now. In heaven, everyone's going to share in everyone else's, you know, the wealth of heaven, so start practicing that now. Make and keep a crystal clear will and estate plan. This is, again, I'm not... Uh, I'm not, a, I used to do trial law, but I never did like wills and estates, but I can tell you from the experience that I've heard indirectly, when wills are not made precisely and clearly, it creates a mess for the family. So make sure it's spelled out crystal clear and that it's kept updated. This is so, so that your wishes are going to be carried out and that your family is going to be protected from having to deal with a mess later on. We're going to talk now about preparing well for your, what's going to happen to your body. All right now, this is an important thing. In fact, it's more important than many people, uh, you know, give give it its due. Okay, we know to begin with that respectful care and treatment of the human body is intrinsic to Catholic identity, and we know that by the fact that we baptize bodies, we give Holy Communion to bodies, nourishment. We provide. Uh, you know, through our works of mercy, health care, food, shelter, clothing. So caring for the human body is intrinsic to our identity. And so it is not only with dying persons, providing them with the anointing of the sick and also viaticum, you know, the final uh, communion before they die. So it's not in, in the way we not only treat dying persons, but how we treat dead human bodies. We treat them with sacredness. That's also part of our Christian tradition. Why? Two reasons. Because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. They are made in the image of God, and they're to be treated with reverence. Secondly, because we will have bodies in heaven. So this body that you're living in right now, get used to it. You're gonna, it's going to be with you for eternity. You're going to be separated from it for a while, but eventually Jesus is going to return. Your body will be resurrected, and it will be rejoined with your soul, glorified beyond imagining. But it will be our bo we will have bodies in heaven. I do want to mention a book, by the way, and I've read a lot of books on heaven. This is, again, among the resource list. A Travel Guide to Heaven, written by Anthony DiStefano. And what I love, I mean, the book is just so magnificently simply written. Uh, deep concepts, but very, very digestible. And his account in here is one of the most compelling I've read because he portrays heaven after the resurrection, you know, as a, you know, a physical experience. And he just portrays it as, it's going to be fun. <laughs> It's going to be fun beyond our wildest imaginings. So Anthony DiStefano's uh, Travel Guide to Heaven. So, so our cemeteries, our Catholic cemeteries, are consecrated grounds. 
We believe they are, yes, they are final resting places, but they're not permanent resting places. They're almost like temporary housing. It might be a few hundred years, a few thousand years, who knows, but eventually our bodies will be resurrected and, and, and rejoined with our souls in heaven. All right, so I want to review for you now briefly what are our funeral traditions in the Catholic Church. Three rites, R-I-T-E-S, that we uh, have for saying goodbye to our loved ones when they die. There's the vigil, also known as a visitation or the wake or rosary or whatever, usually held the night before. The sense is of, uh, you know, this darkness in the evening vigil. It's kind of associated with the, the death itself. The next day being the mass, which is more associated with the resurrection and, you know, prayers. So it's, you know, prayers said for the deceased person. And then the final of those three is the committal ceremony at the graveside or niche where the person is finally laid to rest. So three different opportunities for the church and the family to pray for, the, pray for you and to say goodbye to you. I'm going to say just a little, bit, little word from your sponsor here about who we are at Catholic Funeral and Cemetery Services. So we are a nonprofit ministry of the Diocese of Sacramento. Now that means uh, two things especially. Because we are part of the diocese, that means we are actually an extension of every parish in our diocese. So we are the Catholics of our diocese serving the Catholics of our diocese. We serve everybody and anybody, but we are principally here to serve the Catholic community of the Diocese of Sacramento. So we are you. We are us serving us with uh, end-of-life services. And uh, it, secondly, it means we're a, non we're a nonprofit, which means we are mission focused. And by that I mean our mission is grounded in what are known as the corporal works and the spiritual works of mercy. You may have heard those terms before. So corporal works of mercy are the works of mercy that the church does and that we each as individuals do for the body. Spiritual works of mercy are works that we do for the care of the soul. Just to review those quickly, corporal works of mercy, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, visit the imprisoned, and bury the dead. This is our mission. And then the spiritual works of mercy, teach and share the faith. That's part of what I'm doing tonight. This is part of the mission of who we are at Catholic Funeral and Cemetery Services. Counsel the doubtful, admonish the sinner, bear wrongs patiently, forgive others willingly, comfort the sorrowful, pray for the living and the dead. Comfort the sorrowful, we do that on a daily basis, and pray for the living and the dead. We do that, masses are regularly celebrated at our funeral homes. So, I just want you to know about us and I want you to be proud of us because we are you guys. We are part of an extension of your parish. And I want you to think of what we do, our organization, in continuity with all the other good Catholic charitable enterprises like Catholic hospitals, Catholic schools, Catholic soup kitchens, Catholic homes for unwed mothers, Catholic cemeteries, and Catholic funeral homes. Now, regarding those last two words, we not only provide cemetery locations, but we provide the full array of, of you know, funeral and mortuary services, too. Before I move to the final and most important one about uh, planning for our souls, I want to say a few words about planning ahead. And I'm just going to ha have by a show of hands here, who here has made some plan for, you know, either a cemetery plot or uh, made a funeral plan. I know Deacon Dan, you have, okay, uh, Rosie and your husband, okay. Now keep your hands up. Th those of you who are not raising your hands, look at these people. Do they look like grim, fatalistic, uh, you know, morbid people? No. <laughs> these are people who are responsibly thinking ahead for what's going to happen to their body. They don't want to leave it to their loved ones to have to figure that out. In the same way that it makes sense to have planned ahead for what's going to happen to your possessions, it totally makes sense to plan ahead for what's going to happen to your body. Plan ahead for your funeral services. Plan ahead for where you're going to be laid to rest. So, and we unfortunately we see it every day where I work, 
the, the, the great difference between families that have lost a loved one when there, when there have been plans made in advance versus those when there have not been plans made in advance. So please, if you haven't made those plans, start giving it some thought. I'm going to ask uh, you to pick up uh, another, there's a resource out on the table, five, the top five reasons to pre-plan your end-of-life services. I welcome you to pick one of these up to fill it out, and again, for those of you who are listening remotely, please contact me, I'll be happy to mail it to you. And I'll tell you what, if you fill this out and give it to me tonight, I've got this book, Travel Guide to Heaven, I, got, I will give you a copy of this if you'll fill that card out. And even if you don't, you know, if you've got your plans all made, fine. Just write down, I've got my plans all made out, but I just want to kind of review them with, you know, somebody at uh, Catholic Funeral Cemetery Services. Or if it, it could be like you write down, uh, I don't even know where to start. Write that down, okay? Or uh, I got this urn at home of my grandmother. I'm kind of wondering what I ought to do with it. Write that down, okay? Well, <laughs> We're happy to answer all these questions and help you plan in advance. We've got this uh, also a wonderful guide called a personal planning guide, which will help you uh, understand all the different things that need to be taken care of when someone passes away so that you can have this organized for the sake of your loved ones so that they will uh, you know, not have to deal with that confusion. You know, losing you is gonna be hard enough, the emotional aspect, don't leave them to have to deal with the, the logistics on top of it. All right, let's go on now to preparing well for your soul. Now. Now. That word. In the Hail Mary, the punchline of the Hail Mary, we ask our Blessed Mother to pray for us at the two most important moments of our lives, and what are those? Now and at the hour of our death. I'm going to ask every one of us now to make a commitment to praying for everything that's going to transpire between now and the hour of our death. Now is the time to harmonize ourselves with the harmonies of heaven. And I'll put it in terms of pulling weeds and planting seeds. Pulling weeds. There will be no sin in heaven. So sometime between now and the hour of our death, we need to be pulling weeds. We need to be getting sin out of our lives. We need to be confessing our sins. And it's, it's a lifetime project, right? But don't cling to our sins, okay? Pull those weeds out. And God, remember, is on our side. He's here to provide us assistance and encouragement and uh, sustenance as we uh, go about that project of pulling out what shouldn't be there. So planting seeds, or pulling weeds and now planting seeds, but you'd imagine like moving, let's, look, I'm going to tell you, imagine a foreign country, I'll call, I'll call it Fantasia. And it is the country where everybody wants to move to. It is the most beautiful, gorgeous place on the planet. Everyone, there's no crime. It's all beautiful, gorgeous landscapes. Everyone gets along with everyone. Everyone lives in a beautiful, beautiful home. Everyone wants to go there. But in order to get, be admitted into Fantasia, you have to learn the language of Fantasian, and you have to become acquainted with the ways and customs of Fantasia. You get my point here? We got to learn the language of heaven and the ways of life of heaven. Harmonize with those harmonies now. And what is the fundamental language of heaven? Love. <laughs> Love is the language of heaven. Everyone in heaven gets along marvelously with everyone else in heaven. Okay. Do we get along marvelously with everyone else in our lives? Well, maybe not. Maybe, it, maybe that's not going to be possible, but at least... Do everything that you can to get along now with everyone that you're in a relationship with. 
Everyone in heaven has forgiven everyone else in heaven who has ever done anything wrong to them. Now is the time to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. Cleanse ourselves of any of those attachments to resentment and unforgiveness and you know, guilt for the need to be forgiven. Get rid of all superiority and envy. Nobody in heaven, there is those who are great and those who are small in the kingdom of heaven, but everyone is there for everyone else in heaven. Get rid of any like cravings for prestige and uh, fame, recognition, or status, because that means absolutely nothing in the next life. That's something that a lot of the near-death experiencers will come back and, and talk about. It's just, they just don't care about, you know, that respectability that so many of us just spend our lives pursuing. I'm going to read you some accounts here in a moment of, uh, you know, some near-death experiences to uh, illustrate exactly what I'm talking about. But again, like this work of preparing our souls, you know, God is there to provide us the, the strength that we need for it, right? We're not on our own, but we got to call upon Him. we got to hook ourselves into that sa those sacramental sources of strength. Be generous and kind. Be agents of God's mercy. You know, I heard uh, recently somebody ask, how do I know that I'm growing spiritually? And the answer that I heard was just put it up so well is, are you becoming more merciful? Look at your life that way. Can I say, am I a more merciful person today than I was yesterday or a year ago? Growing in mercy. And again, think of that in terms of corporal works of mercy, caring for the body, and spiritual works of the mercy, praying for people, helping them to learn uh, more about their faith. Do small acts with great love. And now I want to just read you a couple of a small accounts. One, I'll just, well, one is just a brief account. That I don't have it written down here, but I, as I recall it, it was a young man who was a, a star athlete, a star football player who had a, a near-death experience. And up to that point, he and everyone else who knew him defined the, uh, you know, meaning and purpose of his life in terms of his athletic accomplishments. He, under, like, I'm, that's, that's who I am as a star athlete. So if he were, uh, before his near-death experience, if he were, like, imagining, like, my greatest moments, it would be his, you know, a reel, you know, like a video of all his greatest moments on the football field. He has his near-death experience, and those things mattered not at all. They didn't, they weren't bad, but they just weren't, like, in, in terms of, like, what's really important, they didn't matter. But the things that did matter, he recounted, were the consolation that he gave to somebody who had been cut from the team. <laughs> was what something that was illumined and mattered. And let me read you this one account here from a woman named Renee. What was not important in my life review was anything that I had owned or known intellectually. What was important was the purity and motivation of every action, and I recalled the most important of my actions in an instant, and I would have never recalled it Otherwise, it was many years ago when I had worked every summer as a volunteer with uh, retarded children, and there was a child one time, and I had taken this child aside on a very hot day. Not a particularly charming or lovable child, but I wanted this child to feel the love of God that had brought him into existence. And I took him aside, and I just wanted him to feel love, and I gave him something to drink. That was the greatest of all actions. And that just filled me with unspeakable, incomprehensible joy. It was not an action I even remembered, and one that was not done with any thought of reward. It was motivated by selfless love. This is the one now which I'll read to you, and this is from a book, okay? And it's one of these like really, really recommended books on my uh, sheet here from An Army in Heaven by Kelly Janowski, and she, or Jankowski, she's a critical care nurse who's worked both in ICU and in, in uh, 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 hospice settings 
of people who've had near-death experiences, and, and this book is a collection of those stories. And this one, it's called Simon, A Glimpse of Heaven, is just, ugh, blew me away. So on this one sheet, I've summarized some of the excerpts from that account, and I just want to read some of that to you now. And again, he met his deceased mother and father, incredible, you know, uh, uh, encounter of joy with them. He met his two miscarried children. I knew immediately why they had died and how they had prayed for my wife and me from the moment they entered heaven. Okay, now, though, is when he talks, he's, he's talking to Jesus, met Jesus, and Jesus says, I want you to see what I have prepared for you from the moment you were created. We were standing before a huge structure that was incredibly beautiful and shone as bright as the sun. This was my mansion. As I stood in front of it, it was revealed to me that my life was the architect and the source of its construction and design. Everything that I had done during my life that was good, kind, and directed toward the good of another human being, it was all there. Every bowl of soup, every piece of bread, every blanket or an encouraging word, every tender gesture done for the love of God, built and engineered it all. He rewarded to the nth degree every single thing I had done on earth that had pleased him. No other structure looked like mine because every soul's life experience is unique. Your life, your gifts and graces are different than mine and vice versa. All of my prayers, every single one that I had ever offered up to heaven were there. But now listen to this. So all his prayers were up there constructing part of his mansion. But the prayers that I had said for other people were the most pristine and the most ornate of my mansion's decorations. Oh, that just struck me so deeply when I read that because I pray, a lot, but it's like I pray a lot for myself. <laughs> God, give me strength to do this. God, give me strength to do that. But how much time do I really spend on my knees praying for other people? And that is so much of what God is all about. He is self-emptying love for others. We were made in that image and that's how we should live out the balance of our lives, in the service and care and love of others. All right. I'm going to move now to departing thoughts, and then we'll say our concluding prayer. <laughs> Begin the rest of your life with the end in mind. Don't be scared, but do be prepared. Live each day as if it were your last, and one day you'll be right. There's a great quote in the Catechism, uh, paragraph 1014, and it's actually a quote from uh, uh, The Imitation of Christ. Every action of yours, every thought should be those of one who expects to die before the day is out. Death would have no great terrors for you if you had a quiet conscience. Then why not keep clear of sin instead of running away from death? If you aren't fit to face death today, it's very unlikely you will be tomorrow. I saw a tombstone many years ago that I think I'm either going to have it, or this, this epitaph in this tombstone. I'm either going to, I've been thinking I wanted to have it as the epitaph on my uh, tombstone, but now I'm thinking I want to have it like, you know, at my wake, you know, with the coffin lid open and people come up and, you know, pay their respects to me. I want to have this, these, this verse, okay, this is the verse that I saw on this uh, uh, tombstone. And it was from a man who had died, I think, in the 1860s. And it was his message to anybody passing by his grave. He said, remember man, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. Prepare for death and eternity. I'm going to go through now our closing prayer. This is a prayer for a happy and peaceful death.
And some of you I passed this card out to at the beginning. I'll have it up here on the screen for those of you who didn't get a card. But again, all these resources are on the table out there for those of you who are here, for those of you who are online. I'm going to put my cell number up again after the closing prayer. If you didn't get it the first time, please get in touch with me and I'll be happy to uh, follow up with you. Let's pray this together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, you do not desire that anyone should be eternally separated from you, and never is a prayer made to you without hope of mercy. You have promised all things that you ask in my name shall be done for you. And so I ask you, O oh God, for your holy name's sake, to grant me at the hour of my death full consciousness in the power of speech, sincere contrition for my sins, true faith, firm hope, and perfect charity, so that I may be able to say to you with a clean heart, into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O God of truth, who are blessed forever and ever. Amen. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all of you who came out this night. God bless you. That's it. Thank you. Oh, yes, Rosie. Okay, I, I got to say, first of all, I'm German. I'm all about like starting on time and ending on time. So it's like 7.30 has passed. If you want to leave, bye-bye. If you want to, like, a, 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 Rosie Cox, for the sake of those of you who are online, she just asks, or wants to ask a question. So I'm happy to stay here all night answering questions. But again, if you want to leave, you're good to go. So Rosie, question about purgatory. Okay, well, there's a difference between like any, like you, you, you there's the, 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 the punishment, you know, like working off your time in purgatory, you, you can no longer do it. I mean, the, t the time of taking care of the sufferings due to, you, to your soul because of the sins of your life, you, that, that opportunity will pass once you die. So you're, you're, you are then dependent upon the prayers of the church to you know, move you through purgatory. Okay, so yeah, but the, yeah, the time of actually, you know, you got to suffer your way through it at that point. You can't do any, you know, works to you know improve your lot there. So that was Rosie's question. A a anybody else? I'm sorry we can't get questions from those who are attending remotely, uh, but I, I got to tell you, since you're here, I'll tell, I want to tell you my favorite uh, purgatory analogy, and I didn't have time to get into it in the talk, but you know, uh, and maybe my brother Mike is still listening. He and I were paper boys together a long time ago, back when there used to be paper boys, right? Uh, and we had this, or I had this little side business where I would pick up uh, discarded Coke bottles to you know pick them, you know take them back and get a you know get a nickel for them. And, uh, and my favorite place to get to find these discarded bottles was over a creek bed. And uh, so I'd look down and there would be these, uh, you know, really encrusted filthy bottles, I mean, with just dirt and mud on top of them and inside of them. But I saw my nickel there, you know. So I would scramble down and pick that bottle up and pull it out because I knew that bottle was redeemable. <laughs> All right? So no matter how covered with filth it was outside and inside, it was still fundamentally intact. It was still fundamentally capable of being cleansed, but it needed to be purged. Not just cleansed on the outside, but you had to get that bottle cleaner and jam it inside there and pull out that 
So purgatory, it's just like, just the word purge. This is not, or purgative, you're a nurse, you know what, what, what a purgative is, right? I mean, this is like, it's something that basically, you take a purgative to loosen your bowels, all right? It's a, it's a cleansing from the inside out. So purgatory, I mean, thank God it's there, you know, to, to help us get rid of what we were stuck with at the end. But don't think of it in terms of necessarily a pleasant experience. So, uh, yeah, let's, again, look up that resource that's online, you know, how to avoid purgatory. So, anyway, that's uh, 7.30. If you have any more questions, you can come up. I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, but, again, everyone who came here tonight, uh, thank you so much, and God bless you. See you at the final judgment, if not before then. <laughs> Okay, I think we can go ahead and terminate the...